Our guest this weekend is our own Dr. Mark Thornton, a senior fellow here at the Mises Institute, and our topic is booms and busts. Falling stock prices are in the news lately, so Mark and I will talk about how and why central bankers don't understand deflation, whether they're really Keynesians or some variant thereof, what a crack-up boom might look like, i.e. deflationary rather than hyperinflationary, and what the skyscraper index and other forms of irrational spending might tell us about the future of the global economy. Stay tuned for Dr. Mark Thornton. Dr. Mark Thornton, Happy New Year to you, and welcome back to Mises Weekends. It's great to be here. Mark, I'd like to begin by quoting from an article in today's Wall Street Journal. It is Friday, January 22nd. The title of this article is almost surreal to me. It says, Inflation Lows Vex Central Bankers. And the article talks about how uh, the central banks need to respond to persistently low inflation tied to slow growth and falling commodities prices. Last time I checked, most of us like paying less for gasoline. But anyway, uh, they quote Mario Drahi as saying, We don't give up. We are not surrendering in front of these global factors. And they also quote from the Bank of Japan, uh, Governor Kuroda saying, the credibility of Bank of Japan policy will likely take a hit if the central bank doesn't act. I mean, it's almost surreal, isn't it, hearing these central bankers talk about how they need to prop up inflation. Give us your thoughts on it. Well, it seems like we're living in 1984 and everything is upside down. Everything is backwards. It's a world where Inflation is a good thing and deflation or falling prices is a bad thing. And it, it is a crazy, insane world that we're looking at out there, whether it's Japan or Europe or the United States. Uh, all the major economies of the world are in trouble and it's caused by central banks and they don't have a clue as to what they should be doing. Well, you mentioned deflation. Let's talk about that. Deflation seems to be the constant boogeyman of central bankers. From an Austrian perspective, what is deflation and how should we think about it? Well, we think about it as a falling money supply, but of course, everybody else talks about deflation as falling prices. Uh, all of mainstream economics and central bankers fear deflation. They have a phobia about deflation or falling prices. And actually, of course, most of the people in the world, they love deflation. They love paying less for gasoline, for example. They love paying less at the grocery store. Uh, and so the Austrians and everybody in the world view deflation as a good thing. And central bankers and mainstream economists view it as the most awful thing possible in the world. Well, and when we're talking about deflation, we also mean deflation of stock market prices, right? When you talk about booms and busts in your own work and in writing, central bankers fear busts more than anything, whereas Austrians will view busts as painful but necessary corrections. What is the central banker mentality about booms and busts? Since they don't accept Austrian business cycle theory, how do they view booms and busts? Well, they don't like deflation because they associate it with the Great Depression. Uh, they don't like it because of big government debt that is harder to pay off. And so there are some tangible reasons that they see. Uh, they don't want to see falling stock prices because that hurts psychology in the economy. Uh, but Austrians have a view of deflation as it's a necessary process to correct the male investments that are caused by central banks artificially low interest rate policy. So yes, in a correction, stock market prices fall a, a tremendous amount. The price of land falls by a tremendous amount. Uh, the price of warehousing space and retail space, all those leasing rates has to fall dramatically. But you know, the price of milk and the price of toothpaste and uh, the price of paper goods, those are all relatively stable. And so as capital prices, land prices, and wage rates decline, uh, while consumer goods don't decline very much, that creates an atmosphere where entrepreneurs out there uh, see profit opportunities in producing existing goods as well as producing brand new goods. And so the correction and the crash phase in the business cycle gives entrepreneurs this great environment uh, to put resources back together uh, to hire workers, to buy land, to buy office space and all that uh, and produce more goods because they see tremendous profit opportunities. And so during the correction phase, this is when we see a lot of new firms uh, put together small dynamic companies that are producing brand new goods. And so if you go back and you look at the formation of all the great companies, you'll see that a lot of those uh, new ideas took place during previous uh, crashes and corrections. 
Well, it's interesting. You talk about prices falling across asset class in a depression. Um, this is one of the big myths of investment advice, right? That if you diversify, you'll protect yourself. But what we saw certainly with the crash of 2008 is stocks, bonds, real estate, all kinds of investments all came down at once. So diversification doesn't really protect you from central banking. No, it doesn't. And uh, Irving Fisher uh, thought that back in the 1920s, that if you diversified uh, your investments, that you would somehow be protected. But of course, mutual funds that are widely diversified lost uh, just as much money as the overall marketplace. But this view of deflation really gets at the idea of you know, this the error of central bankers and mainstream economists fixation on consumer price index measures and GDP measures. Uh, when Austrians look at it, we're looking at, you know, capital prices, wage rates, consumer goods. We're breaking the, those prices down um, into their separate categories and you get more information. You, you, you understand how the economy works and how jobs are actually created. They don't have any idea of how jobs are actually created, how new companies form and how businesses grow because they don't understand the workings of the economy because they're fixated on the consumer price index and GDP. Now, earlier you mentioned that one reason central bankers hate uh, falling stock market prices is because of the psychology behind it. Let's talk about that. I know Mises talked a lot about the psychology of entrepreneurs and the psychology of the economy and praxeology, so, e economics being a subset of, of greater human action. We've heard politicians say, well, let's be careful not to talk ourselves into a recession. Talk about the role that psychology plays in the boom-bust cycle. Yeah, you would be amazed at how much economists are fixated on psychology in the marketplace. They really view psychology, and this goes back to uh, John Maynard Keynes and before, they think that psychology is moving the marketplace in terms of jobs and GDP and stock markets and that sort of thing. But that's not really the case. Uh, there's got to be real factors that make for this psychology. And Austrians look at central banks artificially reducing interest rates, um, leading to a boom in the economy where everybody's making money, where all investments seem to be profitable. And, of course, the psychology gets very, very positive uh, during that phase. And so there is psychological changes, but it's caused by the instability of central bank policy, it's not caused by mass hysteria. And so as the bust phase comes about and, uh, you know, businesses are losing money, people are losing their jobs, uh, homes are being foreclosed on, naturally this leads to a depressed uh, psychology out there in the marketplace, but it's caused by real factors and it's caused ultimately by the instability of central bank policy and so the central banks uh, are trying to fight this psychology uh, when actually they are the ones that are causing those psychological mass phenomenon. Well, when we use this term Keynesian to describe central bankers, do you think we use it too loosely? In other words, Keynes himself evolved throughout his writings. And uh, we often accuse mainstream economists of criticizing Austrian works without having really read them very thoroughly or understanding them very deeply. Are we guilty of the same thing uh, as Austrians of throwing the term Keynesian around too loosely, do you think? Uh, probably to a certain extent. Um, there's a lot of diversity of opinion in mainstream economics. There's, of course, the neoclassical synthesis, and then there are probably seven, eight, nine uh, other heterodox uh, versions of economics. Uh, but I would say this, that uh, when push comes to shove, they all seem to react to, for example, the economic crisis in pretty much the same way. Uh, they see the economy going into a crisis. They see this change in psychology. And so they resort right back to uh, Keynesian stimulus policies. And of course, they have a diversity of opinion there. But ultimately, it means uh, increasing the money supply, reducing interest rates, uh, deficit spending, uh, you know, public works projects. Uh, and so, yes, there is a diversity of opinion within mainstream economics, but ultimately uh, they all resort back to the same general ideas, whether it's uh, Ben Bernanke, uh, whether it's Paul Krugman. Uh, they just have, you know, different recipes, but they're all cooking the same game, basically. 
But to some extent, across this range within mainstream economists, uh, they're all uh, in, encouraged by the same idea that Keynes did have was that uh, the, the policy of governments and central banks is, should ever and always be to create demand side stimulus. Is that maybe a catch all way of looking at Keynesianism? I would think so. Yeah, they're, you know, that's what uh, the aggregate demand, aggregate supply story is all about is that when there's a faltering in terms of the quantity of production that's going on in the economy in terms of GDP, then you have to come up with some way to stimulate the demand side in the economy uh, to keep GDP growing, to prevent uh, the unemployment rate from rising. Um, they're pretty much, of course, there's supply siders as well. They're kind of on the fringe of the economics profession, um, and they see uh, correctly that tax cuts can stimulate uh, aggregate production in the economy. So, Mark, in his book, The Theory of Money and Credit, which is now more than 100 years old, Mises talked about the limits of monetary policy. He wrote about what he called a crack up boom, where at some point, no amount of stimulus created by a central bank can stave off what, what he described as a potentially hyperinflationary scenario. Now, I've heard critics of the Austrian school say, no, 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 a deep recession or, or a depression is actually deflationary because debt is shed either through bankruptcy or insolvency or marking it to market. And as debt contracts, obviously the money supply contracts. So really Mises was wrong and that a, a deep depression is deflationary. So help us better understand what Mises meant by a crack up boom. Is it necessarily a hyperinflationary event? Or as critics say, is a crack up really a deflationary event? Well, it can go either way. I mean, generally speaking, uh, central bankers and public policymakers have pulled back. They've, they've said, OK, uh, this isn't working. We're going to have to uh, raise interest rates to quell inflation. And so generally speaking, um, they pull back from the edge and um, the economy goes into that correction phase. Uh, but there is the, the outer limit where you can get um, uh, an inflation uh, that they keep feeding, basically, and uh, that inflation um, does, you know, eventually is at very high rates. It, it extinguishes um, long term contracts like bonds. Uh, they become rel relatively worthless. Uh, and then it's just a matter of they, they keep feeding uh, money into the economy and uh, prices uh, start rising. And as at some point, people realize that the money that they're getting uh, is losing its value. And so they decrease their demand for money and the, the economy would spin into uh, into a hyperinflation that has happened in numerous uh, cases. Zimbabwe is the latest case, uh, but it's not the only case. And it's not just third world countries that have experienced these type of hyperinflation. So it remains a possibility um, at the outer limit, as Mises described. Mark, one last question for you. You talk and write a lot about the skyscraper index. Um, nobody can know or perfectly time a boom or a bust phase exactly. But what are some of the indices you look for? Um, you talk about skyscrapers. You know, we can see anecdotal things in the media like Silicon Valley firms that don't make any profit, but they're so full of venture capital that they have these fabulous Christmas parties in Las Vegas. These, these are the kinds of anecdotal things we see that feel a lot like 2008 to us. So tell us uh, about some of the things you look for in predicting a bust. Well, the skyscraper index is when you have a record-setting skyscraper uh, telling us that it's going to be uh, an economic crisis in the world. And China just set a record last year. And of course, it's experienced a lot of uh, negative pain in its markets. It's not doing very well at all. And there is a world record setting skyscraper being built in Saudi Arabia, um, uh, scheduled to be completed, I guess, later this year, next year. And of course, Saudi Arabia is in an economic mess as well. But you also look for the irrational exuberance, the intensive luxury spending, uh, people going, uh, doing just crazy, zany, luxurious spending. Um, and, uh, of course, you can see some of that um, out in Silicon Valley with uh, Apple and Facebook and Salesforce and all these companies building uh, record-setting skyscrapers in California and uh, just uber luxurious uh, corporate headquarters um, in all of those social media high-tech companies. And so it doesn't have to be 
a world record height uh, in terms of skyscrapers, uh, but it can also be any kind of lavish, over-the-top uh, spending out there in the economy. Well, it's starting to feel like 2008, and let's hope it's not feeling like 1929. Dr. Mark Thornton, thanks so much for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. 